paper and say, what are you doing with that? No notes. You're on. Okay, I'm on. Welcome, everybody. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so, okay, so today, my question for you is what the heck am I about to talk about? What's the, the lecture about? Does anyone even know? Because <laughs> I know I don't. I'm just told to show up and talk. Okay, so when we talk about pain, Hi. There's chairs up front. Chairs up front. Just like in church. <laughs> yeah, the walk of shame. <laughs> right. That's all right. Here, I'll sit in the front row. Here we go. It's good to have you. So when we talk about pain, you know, that's pretty a pretty general statement. And what I'd like to do is maybe make the first thing is uh, pain is the wrong word. But it's common, so we use the word pain. The real word is suffering. So the first thing we need to do is, the first thing I had to learn was the difference between pain and suffering, okay? So pain is going through discomfort, but at the end, you have something. It's a pain to weed your garden, but at the end, you get some pretty good vegetables. You know, it's a pain to paint your house, but at the end, your house is protected for another few years. It's a pain to even eat right, to a certain degree, it is a pain organic food and this and that, you're juicing and blending, it's a big pain. But at the end of the day, you're basically avoiding suffering. Suffering is discomfort with loss. Suffering is, you know, uh, trauma, that's suffering. So maybe the first thing we can do is uh, agree on semantics and say, guess what, maybe there's a difference between pain and suffering. Big piece, because if you don't know, you will try hard and not trying, which will ensure suffering. Now, you're not children, and you've been around long enough to see that happen. You've seen people, know people, that have tried hard at not trying. And do you know what I mean by that? It's like they'll do everything not to try. And you'll see that's a hell of a lot of work. It's actually more work than trying. So that's then they ensure suffering. It's a pain to eat right. It's a pain to move the body around. It's a pain to take care of the body. It's a big pain. I've done it for over three decades. It's a pain, but it's not suffering. So we have to understand and we have to identify the difference between pain and suffering, and we have to basically uh, agree on some terms, and that would be a big piece right there. Then we have to identify, okay, there's different types of pain and suffering. There's uh, mental pain, let's say emotional pain, and there's physical pain. And any of us, we all know, we'd much rather undergo physical pain or suffering than mental suffering. Right? It's just the truth. So, because of you know, physical suffering is physical suffering, but mental suffering just plagues you. It just it's deep. There's no getting away from it. So we're gonna try to say, guess what? We want to ascend. Suffering. So there was a, 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 a guy named Buddha. Has anybody ever heard of Buddha? <laughs> Good friend of mine. Good, yeah, probably. <laughs> You've been around long enough, it's possible. So, so, so when they asked Buddha what is enlightenment, and you know what his answer was? Not suffering. There's no definition to enlightenment, but I'll tell you what enlightenment isn't. Enlightenment isn't suffering. So that's a really profound statement, and that's something we really want to think about. So when we say, okay, we're going to have a little lecture on pain, we have to really say, well, it's pain and suffering. And then we have to agree on terms and say, you know what, though? Sometimes pain is where the growth is. You know, my teacher, you know, uh, would explain it that way. You polish the soul with the sword, okay? And I spent a lot of time saying to myself, what the hell did that even mean? You know, a lot of these cryptic little Taoist sayings that meant nothing until I was like 30 or something, and then pop into your head and say, aha, I get it now. So let's look at that, polishing the soul with the sword. So the sword represents your physical body in that alchemical sense, because in traditional Chinese medicine, the physical body is broken down into these five elements. Well, so is the sword. So a sword is basically the physical manifestation of the physical body. The consciousness is the soul, whatever you want to call it. But the fact that the consciousness has to do time in this rotting flesh, there's evolution there or not? 
consciousness basically evolves by doing time and form. That's the statement. Okay, pretty heavy statement to tell a 17-year-old kid. But there's truth there as we look at it. So we have to say, okay, what does that mean? The first step is to go through the process of accepting, okay, I got a choice. I could take care of the body or I could be tormented by the body. That's really it. So then you've got to make that active choice. Now, everybody in this room knows all this because you're not kids. You're smart. You have to be or you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't make it this long. It's, it's just the truth. Because I've trained, you know, warrior, scholar, sage. So I've trained kids. You know, that'd be all the warrior stuff from 8 to about 22. Teaching them, sir, yes, sir, give me 20 push-ups. I want a double kick. Get down. You know, and all that. That's how you train. You turn a boy into a man. And you do all of that. And they don't know black belt discipline. They don't know courtesy. They say, yeah. They stand there like this with their hat on backwards. Right? And so my job was to teach them how to be, you know, a strong uh, adult. And that's cool, through discipline and pain. <laughs> you know? And so and it was great. So with this group, you don't need that. You're courteous, you have respect, you understand responsibility, or you, you just wouldn't have made it this far. So that's great for me. So then it's like, okay, we don't need to talk about the rudimentary nonsense about do the right thing so you don't suffer. You know this. Okay, so let me have to say, okay, well, let's look at the suffering of the human body, and let's start with some real basic stuff that you can use today. When we talk about the biggest pill that you can take for suffering, okay, it's one word. I only have one word to say. Move. Yeah, that's it. All you got to do is move. We can, I can write a book on it. I should have like a 500-page book, and you open it, and it's all it says is move. On every page? Yeah, yes. Yeah, I get it. I get it. You know? So, because that's really, if you really wanted to look at it. And I, one of my little hobbies is um, I like to surf the internet for all things health related, all health related news, and watch what they have done with the, you know, medical developments and all the research. And it really is amazing, really. And so I'm always looking at this. And if you research pain management, which maybe you have, they all say the most important thing you can do is keep moving. So I can add, if you want to get really creative and I want to add a next piece to the book, I can put keep in there. Okay, now I'm really getting crazy. Keep moving. The sequel. Yeah, the book number two. You know? So keep moving. And so why does keep moving even work, you know? And there's a, a fine line. We don't want to over move and damage our body, but we do need to move every day for a minimum of one hour and a half, every day. And so the first half hour should be what they call a low grade aerobic. And I'll explain to you why and how this all works. The low grade aerobic is basically chi bump and some Tai Chi. So you can do it and you can have a conversation. I mean, once you get good at it, you can remember what the heck you're doing. But you can, you, in other words, though, there's enough oxygen. You can, you can handle this. A higher grade aerobic, that's the next half hour, heart rate goes up. You cannot have a conversation. So now maybe you're doing Taoist palm movements and some more Tao Yin and really like yoga and stuff like that. You're really doing it. You can't have a conversation. So that's a higher grade aerobic. So we have a low grade, high grade aerobic every day, a minimum. And you can do it through just the low grade is just take a walk in the morning. High grade is get on a bike or do something or go up a hill or do your more advanced high G and chiba. And then the third piece is anaerobic. Some type of uh, dynamic tension, you know, like we were doing yesterday, or light strength training just to break down the uh, muscle and rebuild the muscle. It's a real kind of a simple thing. But those three things create a chain reaction. And this is the chain reaction. Who are we and what are we fighting? When we really talk about pain, we might want to replace the word pain with another word. And what would that word be? Aging. Okay, aging. Arthritis. 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 Discomfort. Another word. These are all byproducts of this one word. Ache. Pardon me? Aching. Aging. Byproduct. Ache. Aching. Byproduct. Inflammation. Oh, yeah. Inflammation is the number one, like, 
they, they can kind of read the body, its biological age by the percentage of inflammation in the body. Inflammation, inflammation, inflammation. That's really what it's all about. All of the different pain is based on the body's response to pain. And it's inflammation because the immune system's, you know, kind of getting to it, trying to get to it. Trying. And it's usually, here's the good news, it's not strong enough. So it's like this air conditioner. So uh, luckily it is strong enough. But if it wasn't, it would never get to the, whatever, 78 degrees. So it's always on. It's never quite strong enough to get the room cool. So click, it clicks off. So that's your, let's talk about maybe tennis elbow. All right, so, or something like that. Your body isn't really strong enough, cellular division, all this nonsense, okay, but it's inflamed. And it's not strong enough to get in there and fix it. So it's in this constant state of inflammation, and it can't push you over the hill. How do they fix a tennis elbow? I have a buddy who's a big surgeon. You do a lot of exercise. Okay, what about surgery? What's the surgery? Does anyone know? Yeah, you create a little incision, and you scrape it. The tendon with the scalpel. Straight. You create a wound. And now all of a sudden, there's enough to come and fix it. Now it's a big enough problem for the immune system to really show up and rebuild that. That's what they do. It's a strategic, <coughs> strategic trauma. So but as we age, our immune system isn't really strong enough to completely fix it. So it's like, you know, the government working on a road. They're just there for it. You know what I mean? So, oh, really? Really? And so that's, that's kind of what happens to us because we, our immune system really isn't strong enough to address. So it's like autoimmune keeps going, like Crohn's and things like that. You're, you have these nice roundup ready intestines from eating all of your genetically modified foods. And so you're, I'm serious. And so the lining of your intestine is basically covered with uh, roundup, which is... Uh, uh, we kill. We kill. It's awesome. And now your system's trying to cope with that. It's trying to get rid of it. And that's what they're finding is a little byproduct of, you know, genetically modified foods. So that that's a thought. But what does it do? It turns on chronic inflammation. Okay, so that's where we're trying to give you a couple of simple examples to bring you home common sense, okay, inflammation. So inflammation. The biggest way to manage inflammation, the biggest system to manage inflammation is movement. And what system does that engage? Yes? Yes, thank you. You get a shiny stick. I got little stickers, and she gets a happy sticker, okay? <laughs> and if you misbehave, you get a stormy cloud. So you don't know when you leave. So she's got the shiny, happy sticker. So the lymphatic system, okay, are we all aware of what the lymphatic system is? Who here does not have one? I know I don't. I, I had mine removed when I was a kid. So, impossible. Okay, so there's two types of fluid, main, major fluids in the body, right? And what are they? Blood and lymph. All right, what's the percentage of blood and what's the percentage of lymph? Seven, seven times seven. the 46 yeah. lymph. It's probably, you know, Bad math, 70-40, common core, once again, no, 70-30, right? Okay, so it's like 70% lymph fluid. Okay, lymph fluid. And what is lymphatic fluid? Do we know what the lymph system does? Any? Filter, filter, autoimmune, yeah, these are all pieces of it, isn't it? Removes waste, it's the sewer system. So you can look at blood as the kitchen. And it brings the nutrients to the cells of the body. But guess what? Anything, even a cell, that consumes, right, excretes waste. That's the basic definition of a living organism. It has to be able to consume and evacuate. So you have trillions of cells in the body that are consuming and basically evacuating waste. Where does the waste go? In the lymph. The job of the lymph system is to take that waste bring it to the lymph nodes, right? In which we all know we have them here and here and here and throughout here and then in here. And those is how you filter. It's, ha-ha, we got something. And it releases and it starts to basically do all the work 
lymph nodes kind of get in there and work on, let's say it's like a filtration system pump, you know? But the lymph fluid is really where all the cellular waste goes, all right? Now, that's why we check your pH. Quickest way to see what's going on with your lymph fluid, and which would then tell you how acidic. Most of us walk around in a, a chronic state of acetosis, which is completely acidic. And when you're acidic, you're inflamed. That's just it. And so what's imperative here, and here's the problem with the lymph system, it doesn't move. You have to move. Like the circulatory system, the blood gets the free ride. It's pumped, it's moved, it goes. Limb system is like, no, if you're not moving, it's not moving. And that's a problem. So it's a much more, you know, you have to actively get involved in this lymphatic system. It lets you get, even get crazier. If you move too fast, it turns off. Yeah, right. So, yeah, because your body is not going to do maintenance when it's being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. You know, that's how God made it. So it's like, we'll do the maintenance later when we're gathering berries. So the act of gathering berries, okay, now it's going to start doing the work. It's a relaxed motion, okay? Too fast, nothing. No movement, nothing. And that's why we say low-grade aerobic. This is why we do that, to turn on that lymphatic system. It's, and we have pumps here in our pools, and your pump has to go, right? So many hours a day, depending upon the temperature. Well, the body has to move so many hours a day, depending upon, basically, the intake. So if you're going to spend Saturday night, you know, playing rock and roll, drinking tequila and beer, not that I would ever do that, but if you did, <laughs> you better get up that next morning and move, because you're just all blown out. That's the pain you feel, the, the inflammation, the swelling, the pounding. This is the, the, the system itself is basically unbelievably acidic. Now, do that for a long time, and what happens? You feed cancer. Cancer cannot grow in a pH-balanced environment. It has to have acid. And so we look at the biggest piece of pain, really, is moving that lymphatic system. Pain management is moving. Okay, move the body. Why? Well, because really what you did is you turned on the pump. You turn on the pump? Yeah. And now I can filter all of the cellular waste out. Cellular waste and waste of the human body is removed, right, in the metal element in traditional Chinese medicine, which belongs to the lungs and large intestine. Okay? And then the water element, bladder. But 70% of the waste in your body is removed by your lungs. Isn't that a weird thing? That's why you smell people's breath. You're like, uh-oh, something's wrong with him. Uh-oh, you can tell by their breath what's going on with their lymph fluid. Your breath, every time you exhale, if you just exhale in front of a mirror, you'll see there's moisture on it. That's cellular waste. Okay, so it's a, uh, and that's why you even lose a little bit of weight at night, simply from exhaling. Cellular waste. And so breathing and moving, now we're getting really complicated. Not only do I want you to move, I want you to breathe while you're moving. That's right. And I want you to breathe in time with your movement. Ah, I want you to inhale as you draw in and exhale as you expand out. So now I have movement and breath as one. So I've turned on the system. I turned on my pool pump. We all know about edema. Right? What is edema? Swelling. swelling of the legs. What is making it swelling? Water. And what is that water? It's lymph fluid. And so you put your finger and it's like, oh my, there's still a finger mark. Right? It's like, uh oh. What's the best way to deal with edema? Breathe. Orthopedic socks. No. Move. <laughs> and that's why I'm selling orthopedic socks today. <laughs> It's like a big orthopedic sock pitch. Wouldn't that be horrible? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you're right, with the 10 Wellness logo with my picture on it. The numbers all over. It's like, really, dude? Really? I should one day for that. <laughs> well, right after the book. Yeah, yeah, right after my book. Yeah. If you don't have a sense of humor, you'll cry. So, I, I'm just, yeah. Gotta laugh. So, okay, 
So, so let's think a little bit about this. So you get all this, it drops. It's all literally dropping. So when I move, that's why the first thing we teach you is what? Small triangle, large triangle, standing on the boat. Oh, wait on the big toe, everybody. Drop onto the heels. Really what I'm doing is turning on a pump. I know you're flexing the calves, so that's going to get the blood back up. Good job. But also, flexing the calves, the lymphatic system brings everything back. It's called like a subclavicle vein here. And then it drops in. It's got to get on calm all the way up. Then it drops, woof, and out. So I have to move, and I have to pump, and I have to stop this gravity and uh, lack of movement from dropping all this fluid below my knees and blowing it up like a balloon. And then if it stays that way long enough, right, what happens? Who shows up next? Protract, pardon me? Neuropathy. neuropathy. Yeah, you know what neuropathy is? That's a real party. So. Inflammation of the nerves. Is anybody? It's really yeah. It's uh, it's like this. Here's a, a layman simpleton definition. So we know there's you have a, an extension cord, right? It's got insulation on the extension cord, and that's okay. But I'm gonna take this extension cord and I'm gonna dip it in acid. What happens to the insulation? It's, it basically gets eaten away. So now you have this raw wire that would be your nervous system. So the myelin or the insulation around the nerve has been eaten away. And one of two things happens. It either gets crazy painful or nothing. You've got the numb, floppy fish foot. But either way, it's a problem. Okay? And so what is that? It's just basically protracted, prolonged, extensive, you know, sedentary living. Then after a while, the system breaks down. So now you have this, you know, edema and neuropathy. And then, of course, you stop moving. Then what happens? The joints start to go. So it creates this unholy chain reaction. So the most important thing is you must keep moving. Just because, you know, we were born to toil in the Garden of Eden. Didn't it say in the big fat book somewhere? And I guess they meant it. You were not born to, 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 to drive around Safeway in a rascal. You just weren't. <laughs> You, and you weren't born to, you know, sit in the golf cart. That's not how God did it. You either are running about or you're consumed by a saber-toothed tiger. That was it. Right? And then, of course, being human beings, we corrupted that. Now look at us. So, well, we, we are actually designed as a species, a creature, to stay biologically from 45 to 55 years until death. And the human body is designed to live how many years? Depend upon the book you read, right? Yeah, if you're Methuselah, sure. But uh, it's uh, the average human being is designed to go 108 to 120 years. They're saying right now that there's someone alive that's going to live a thousand years. Think of the taxes that poor fool. Yeah. I mean, you know, when I think about that, I'm like really, oh my God. So, but that's expensive. <laughs> So, but that, that's a whole other story with what they're doing with uh, research on DNA, right? And they're looking at what's going on with the myelin, and the, we'll deal with that in some other conversation. So, who cares how long you live? It's how well you live. I'd rather, I'd rather live, be alive, be inspired mentally, physically, emotionally for 33 years and just drop dead, than live 108 years in the last 50 years. I'm a miserable bastard, going through all kinds of hell, sitting there at all kinds of medical appointments and dealing with nothing but me and my cat. And, I don't want that. <laughs> you know, it's like, give me a, you know, so so to live every day is to live long enough. And so that's what they call Taoism. They talk about becoming an immortal. And an immortal in Taoism isn't someone who lives forever, it's someone who lives every day until they die. And so that's a big one. So adding quality to life is adding quality to your backyard pool by simply turning the damn pump on. And turning the pump on, in this case, is moving. In moving, we start this positive chain reaction. First thing that happens is we turn on the pump. So in turning on the pump, we start to basically filter, you know, and balance the pH in the body. I recommend everybody here, they sell them online. They sell pH test strips. Do you know what your pH is? So you know what your, you know, acid and alkaline, and what should it be? Do you know, 7.4. 
it's, I think it's 7.4 something, right? And so that's where you really want it to be. And you take it three times a day, in the morning, afternoon, and night. How do you do it? It's a silly little piece of, uh, it's like a little, 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 little piece of, uh, yeah, paper. You put it in there, and what color is it? You put it next to it. Now they have them where you put it in there, or you can uh, put it in front of your urine stream, and it'll tell you everything, your white blood cell uh, count, everything. It's like better than doing blood work. And you can see what's going on. Am I fighting an infection? My white blood cells are way up. What's happening? I can look at my whole system immediately. It's crazy stuff. And it's cheap. It's like you know, 30 bucks for 200 of these strips. So nowadays, you can really know. You know, and to watch your pH is a big one. And so there's a couple ways you can do it. You can be the guy that stays away from everything acidic, right? Then that's okay. Or you can be the person that kind of balances it but moves. Because, you know, things are acidic. It's just life. You can't be Mr. All I do is deep leafy greens guy. You know, and you can, but it doesn't end well. So, you, you know, you do need a little bit of meat or you do need a little bit of grain. You know, you need to have it. But then you have to have a system that can cope with it. And that's where the movement comes from. So a combination. And then there's like, well, do you talk about diet, Mike? No. Why don't I talk about diet? Because I don't know anything about it. No. <laughs> everybody is different. So your diet is different than your diet. My diet, if you ate my diet, it might kill you. I don't know. You know what I mean? It's like, it, yeah, there's no ideal diet for everybody because of our constitution, our blood type, everything. How old we are, our physical activities. Sure, you can say there's a general caloric intake suggestion. Sure, but I can't sit there and give you diet advice. I'm pretty sure a bowl of candy three times a day won't do. <laughs> but, you know, outside of that, that's all I got for you. But, well, yeah, there's a whole other story. Right. So you create, but the goal is how does your body more importantly, not what you eat, how do you process what you eat? And the first step in processing what you eat is move. Turn on the pump. Big one. I cannot say it enough. Because you wake up in the morning, and I asked some of you before we started the class who was in pain. Well, after the class, do you feel any better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see it? Because I use my magic chi healing. <laughs> I'm a chi emissions master. So, no. No, you moved. That's it. And so you kind of cut back on that inflammation a little bit. And that's all it is. It's a minor, minute, you know, change. It makes a huge difference. So movement is your friend, okay? Because of the impact on the lymphatic system, which then ultimately has an impact on inflammation, which is ultimately having an impact on how acidic the system is. So there's like your little chain reaction. If you're not feeling good, no matter how horrible you feel, move. Get your butt out of bed and move. Now, how do we do it? There's a few ways you can move. I'm not saying get out of bed and pop off 50 jumping jacks. So the easiest way, especially if you're in real pain, is start with laying down in bed, lower abdominal breath. Pull, push. Everything's moving. Everything's moving. Pulling up the perineum, you know, like you're interrupting a urine stream flow. Uh, dropping, flinging in all six directions. I'm just laying in bed. I can lay in bed, not get out of bed, and I you you'll see my sheets would be wet from sweat just doing that. And I and uh, see with my thing and my ankle and my shoulder, fine. Lay in bed, just do the lower abdominal breathing. That in itself will have a huge impact. So now you're not just oh my god I'm in pain. I just had this procedure and. Whatever the story is, I can't get up and do my diet. I can't even stand. Okay. Do the lower abdominal breathing. 108 breaths. Take you about 16 minutes. And that in itself will have a huge impact. Then get up. But don't just pop up. Sit up. Lift the head. Drop the shoulders. Straighten the spine. Inhale, exhale. More breath. Seated meditation. You can even do the seated eight pieces of okay. Moving the neck. Lifting the arms. Turning. All of this, so now, okay, okay, because I've had to do this, you know, I mean, I've experienced pain too, you know, it's just how it is, and so either from being an idiot, you know, and working too hard, or, you know, when I was a kid fighting, you would fight, and so you'd get hurt, couldn't even eat in the morning, your jaw would move, so you had to do something, you know, and so you do the uh, seated first, uh, laying down, then the seated, now get up. 
And before you do anything, stand at the edge of your bed and do 108 heel lifts. That's it. And now what are you doing? You're turning on the lymphatic system. So that in itself. But now we're going to start triggering other things. By adding this movement, the musculoskeletal structure kind of kicks in. And so by basically by standing and flexing, uh, a couple of things happen. And I tell you, okay, guys, let's shake the nine gates. The reason I do the beginning stuff is for your pain. It's really, do I need I don't need to do that. I don't need to do that. I, I do my stuff. I move along. But so what? You guys have to do this. Shake the nine gates. Okay, breathe. I'm working with the lymphatic system, and now I'm starting to break up what they call fascia adhesions. So the skin sticks to the fascia. Do you know what fascia is? Mm -hmm. Do you ever hunt and skin a deer? It's that silver stuff. Yeah, well, I say give it a try this weekend. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying here. Okay. So, so you have this silver stuff, you know what I mean? Well, your skin sticks to that silver stuff when you sleep every night, like Velcro. That's why you're all stiff. You've got to, what you call break up. Yeah, ralphing and things like that, and scraping we do. Break up the fascia adhesions. That's number one. That has a huge impact. And number two, you know that the, the actual muscles stick to the bone? So you move. You now you break the muscles, you're not sticking to the bone. I got movement, I got circulation, I got energy moving through it. Okay, now my internal organs. Move. <laughs> well, your organs stick together. Visceral fat and, again, internal adhesions of the organs. You know that, right? So that's how they can tell your biological age upon death. They just take a look at how large the organs are. As we age, they kind of get smaller, and they get kind of nicely wrapped in yellow putrefied fat. <laughs> well, that would be you. And so, so we have to break that up with heat and motion. Okay? Again, I had buddies, because a lot of my friends are in the medical industry, and they'll, they'll look at a patient before they split them open and make a bet. And what they're going to be looking at for the organs. They can tell just by, you know, the way the eyes are, the way the face is. You can just tell what's going on with someone's guts long before you split them open. I know, it's nice. Yeah. I mean, that's how they put it. I'm like, okay, that sounds fun. I can't wait for you to work on me. You know? But so the way you can tell someone's biological age is by the size of these organs and how much basically fat is wrapped around them. And so when by, by moving, you're basically helping break that down. That's going to have a huge impact on how comfortable it is to be in your body. Does this make any sense? Mm -hmm. So we start this positive chain reaction. Also, when I'm standing and I'm flexing, the bones kind of get put into the sockets correctly. Like we did a little exercise this morning to pull the hips, the head of the femur, back into the socket joint. So we get used to flexing. Okay, pull them up, back, suck them in, nice, hold them there. Because not, if not, it's weak, and they're moving, but it's not really correctly aligned. And after a while, it kind of creates friction, right? And then you, it's inflammation, your good friend, in this case specifically of the bursa, which is that little turtleneck, if you will, around a joint. And now you have bursitis. And who comes after bursitis? That's right. So it's like, damn it. You know? It's like, here's another bad chain reaction every way you turn. So it's like, well, maybe I can get it up, in, and hold. And that's... That's the goal. So in the physical movement, it's about aligning, we call it stacking bones, by basically holding the right postures, the muscles flex, and kind of pull everything in the right spot. That's why we do standing practices. So now the muscle mass, the muscle belly, is being flexed. Off the muscle belly, you have it's kind of like uh, sails and ropes. So you got the muscle, and then you have ligaments and tendons, right? And what's the difference between a ligament and a tendon? Anyone? Yes. Ligaments go bones together, tendons go muscles to bones. Smart one. Another shiny happy sticker. You get two happy stickers. Yeah, that's right. So, so ligament is kind of like leather. You can look at it that. You have ligaments between the joints, and the ligaments hold the joints together like strips of leather. In your case, more like bacon. Okay, and so, so, so you have this dried, crum crunchy bacon holding your bones together, which are more like chalk. So you're bacon and chalk, and you're wondering why this is going to go bad. And so, so what we need to do is a ligament is a solid one because it gets little or no circulation. 
it's a problem. And so what we need to do with a ligament is heat it up from the inside out. So when you're standing in these postures, you're like, really, this guy's, I came all the way here and he's going to be standing like this, really? It's, I can see your face. You're, you're ready for a dynamic dive roll, you know, sweep. And I got you standing there like this. Because I know it takes a minimum of three minutes, but ideally 20 minutes, of standing like this. Now the heat generates from the inside out. And you're heating up the ligaments. Okay, real good one because that helps where there's heat, there's circulation of chi and blood. So now, great news. Next step, I'm flexing. So I've got this flexed muscle belly, and off the muscle belly is a tendon. Like, call it maybe a rope. And your body is nothing but a series of uh, ropes and pulleys. Okay, I, I know I'm grossly simplifying this. But, you know, and so by flexing this muscle, I pull this rope. And the more I do it, you know, A, the rope itself is getting used to tension. It's expanding and contracting. And tissue expands and contracts. What happens to the tissue? It hydrates. That's what it does. Okay, so now as opposed to it being a dry rope, it's a nice moist rope. Okay? And as opposed to it being a slack rope that kind of falls off the pulleys and goes, eh, 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 things are clicking and stuff. It's like, okay, it's strong enough, it's in line, and it's moving and tracking nicely. So that's why it's imperative we, we stand and we move so that we can develop uh, ligaments and tendons, okay, by basically flexing various muscle bellies. Does this make any sense? Mm -hmm. What the hell does that have to do with pain? Everything. Because then, if the tendons are, are correct, you know, strong and regularly activated, the joint in itself is correctly aligned. When the joint is aligned, it's not going and creating this grinding and inflammation and then basically breakdown. So movement, movement, movement from a musculoskeletal standpoint. It's the skeleton. Now I'm standing here. Well, you know what? If I stand like this long enough and deep enough, long enough, my femur starts to bend because my thighs are flexing and so are my, it's going like this, a micro bend, but a bend nonetheless. When that bone bends, what happens? It triggers the osteoblast, osteoclast, basically laying down new bone. It's called supply and demand. There's a thing called Wolf's Law, weight-bearing exercise. Uh, uh, basically stimulates this bone density. So, we don't do that, no. but we're going to go on a cruise. I love when you guys go on cruises. It's like Humpty Dumpty. I get nervous when you go on a cruise because i got to put your ass back together and say, <laughs> they came back and ah, what's left of you? I hope Paraguay was nice. You know, it's, like, it's really bad. But anyways, um, I even lost my train of thought. <laughs> I was actually there. All these faces. Uh, oh, sweat. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. So so you're going to go on this cruise, right? And this is with the first step of your little horror show. You're at the airport. You pull out your suitcase, and you rip the tendon off the bone. <laughs> right? I've seen it. Oh, yeah. I pull up and roll up like a shade because you have this chalk bone. Okay, and these little wacky weak tendons, and you're going to engage them though because you're late. And they lift up this big 60 pound, and it's 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 on chalk, so it just pulls right off the bone, and you get a nice little chunk of the bone too, kind of winding up in there. It's, right? it's either happened to you or you know someone. It's a real party, so we have to go from the inside out. So we work on bone density, so that when the tendon is connecting to that bone, and the tendon is nice and moist and strong. It doesn't pull off the bone. So solid bones and good, 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 like good, moist, solid ropes, you know, very important piece. So it's like the whole system kind of starts to create this positive chain reaction from your movement. Does this make any sense? <laughs> Question so far? I try to make it exciting. Otherwise, it's like you're back in school taking basic anatomy. Anyone? Anyone? You know, it's like, really? So I know, it's, it's hard. Um, Can we go back to the outline and, up and, and acids part of the body? Sure. What about alkaline water? What does that do? Oh, that cost a lot of money. Costs a lot of money. Yeah, you know, I'm a water snob. 
I, I yeah. I, I wouldn't wash my feet with your tap water in the city. I would not wash my feet. It's like, really? I can smell the chlorine. I can taste the myriad of chemicals. You know, because you, what you ever, whatever you take winds up in that. And that filtration system that they use is from 1942. It's, you know, it's like, really? I can't drink it. I cannot drink it. What do you do? I don't drink water. Beer. Beer and tequila. <laughs> Because it's all refined. <laughs> so that's no, no, no. What uh, This is what you do. This is what I recommend. You go out and you buy a ranch that has a 2,800 feet deep Artesian spring water well. That's what I did. That's my solution. And if you can't do that, you're pretty much screwed. Uh, <laughs> but I'm good. What is their best to that drop? It hey, was that you ever heard of Castle Hot Springs? Yeah, I've been That's there. That's where I live. I've been to. I was there. Probably was drove. Building it. Oh, okay. So you know where I talk about. Yeah. yeah. And it was there, but it's not free. But that's water's a problem. Yeah, water's a problem. Water's a big problem. And I, and I, then my only solution, I'm, I'm sorry, is get a well. You know, a good one, and not a. Uh, you, you, it's like really it's such an unrealistic solution, you know. But you can buy my bottled spring water <laughs> with my, you know, edemic socks. So I was like, <laughs> so, uh, so I don't know. I wish I had a better answer for you. I spent years running around the springs with bottles of water, and I'm a total water phobe. You know, it's like really bad. So that, that's a problem, you know. But the best way to manage and keep the body, the pH level. The easiest way is move. That really is. The next way is best you can drink a, a, a good amount of water and the cleanest water you can get your little hands on. That's a good start. And then you could watch your acidic intake, you know, and know what foods turn to acid, you know, and what food is alkaline, you know, upon digestion. So you can do a little research on that. But fries doesn't sell kimchi. Kimchi, jigae. I love kimchi. Kimchi is great. Do you know kimchi? Yeah, yeah. 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 I yeah. lived on kimchi in uh, Hubalini, which is uh, kind of kimchi that radishes. So with my teacher, kimchi's, if you can get your hands on kimchi, kimchi, which fries doesn't sell it. This one over here, this organic oh, ruby fries. Sprouts has the life living in there. Yeah, you want the good you can kimchi? make your own. You yeah, I know. I had a buddy that made this. Yeah. But you know what kimchi is? It's basically pickled cabbage. I, I know I grossed this in Lee leaves. Lee leaves, yeah. Kimchi's great for balancing. Now, kimchi, nothing grows in kimchi. Kimchi, K I M C H E E. It's a Korean food from the bowels of hell. You know what I mean? I mean, I like it now, but it took years of, slowly, yeah, years of, of abuse to get me to eat that stuff. I went from lasagna to kimchi. So there's a bit of a gap there, you know, that I get to. So, so I, uh, that might be a way too, you know, to manage the pH. Kimchi is a reasonable. There's a million. You can Google it. And there's all kinds of, you know, good green drink products too. Deep leafy greens are your friend. Another way. So I hope that helps you a little bit. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, the hour and a half of movement yeah. Can that be spread out? Absolutely. Days? Yep. That's correct. And uh, the older you get, here's the great news, the more you got to move. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes, sir. What's wrong with taking uh, prescription medicine for uh, pain? What's wrong with it? Uh, yeah. Oh, God. So. I got the FDA watching this, so it's great for you. Double up. There's my answer. They'll come right over here. Too. You gotta be careful. They're uh, You know, prescription medicine. It's like it's a, prescription medicine is a lot like in-laws. You know what I mean? Like it's good, it's bad. You know what I mean? There's, it's, you gotta learn to balance with the in-laws. And you got to learn the balance with your prescription medicine because I got to tell you, some of times, if you don't have it, for some of us, we're up for dead. So, given a choice, I'd go with not dead. You know what I mean? So, that would be me. But it's my last choice. So, I, I you know, I do oriental medicine, so I'll, I, I can literally needle myself and 
So for a lot of the things that you take a prescription for, I can treat myself. So I uh, thank God I have never no real prescription medicines. But you know, some of you you have no choice, especially if it's keeping you alive. Well, then you just thank God and you take that. And then, but I have found, for example, my father. This is a guy that would drink one beer a week on Sunday. And it'd be a big thing, his beer. It'd be a bad beer, too, like Blatt's or something. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? One beer and that's it? It's not even cold enough. And he's really enjoying it. You know, it's a Chicago cop. And this is just like, you know, the classic John Wayne American man. He died of a drug overdose. Mm -hmm. Is that a crime? Mm -hmm. This is a guy that really was, wasn't a drinker, just the uh, classic American hairy-knuckled man. You know what I mean? And there he is, dead. He was only 70. In the last five years, six years of his life, he was a, a raving drug addict. You name it. Well, what started was pain. And then a couple of these, and a couple of these, and now he's got a couple of these, and now he's got a couple of these, and all of these different Vicodins, and, and he had them hidden in vents. And I, he had 14 pharmaceuticals that he would take a day. And so I would go, and I'd go to his doctor with my attorney, and say, hey, this is bullshit. Uh -uh. And we get him down to two. Because this man is not your profit center. What's bullshit and what's keeping him alive? Oh, oh, these two. Oh. And then, but no, he loved that candy. Before you know it, he's back to 14. I got to go back with my attorney. Then I had to call all the Walgreens and all of the and put the red flag on him when he goes to get more. Sorry, <laughs> sir. You're cut off. He's like, ah! And so, but nonetheless, you know, he took, uh, they gave him a new pain medicine. He tried it. He dropped that on a Monday morning. That was it. <clears throat> Nothing I could do. And I knew how to fix the guy. But you can't never teach your parents. So you just shut up and you honor him and you deal with it. And so that was my story. And I watched that. You know what I mean? There were two, though, that did keep him alive. And I think he should have kept, kept taking those. But the other 12 probably wasn't the good plan. And so it cost me my dad. And there's nothing I can do. So it's like, you know, you got to be really vigilant and you got to ask yourself, you know, is this keeping me alive or not? You know, so that would be my suggestion. Because I can't say part, uh, uh, prescription drugs are bad. There's no, nothing's bad. Nothing's good. Everything is yin and yang. It's how you use it. A hatchet, is it good or bad? Well, it can, you know, chop a tree down or it can cut your foot off. Well, I don't know. So we got to be careful with, you know, is this, that, that's my, my view. So I hope that answers your question. Any other questions before we move on to the next topic? I don't have much time. Okay, so when we talk about pain management, that's definitely something we want to think about. Last couple seconds, we can talk about the real pain. And the real pain and the real suffering is right between your ears. Oh, yeah. Because if you truly, which I have not reached this point, Okay, because I'm if I reached this point, I wouldn't be talking to you clowns. Okay? I'd be on a mountain floating in a cloud or doing something really cool. But I'm not. Here it is, Tuesday morning, and I'm talking to you. So yeah, <laughs> too bad for me. So but that's okay. So if you can truly reach a higher level of mental, you know who demonstrated it best? There was a monk who protested Vietnam. Remember him? And he just sat there, they covered him with gas, and they started him on fire, and he didn't even bat an eye. So there's a guy that can ascend pain and suffering because of true mastery of the consciousness, and truly realizing it's just consciousness, in this case, leaving a burning body. And that was it. That's the highest level. I can't, so don't try to start me on fire. <laughs> so I got a fire extinguisher. But, uh, but the point is, a lot of our suffering begins and ends between our ears. And a lot of the suffering comes from three places. Okay? Projecting forward. Whenever you project forward, you create anxiety. That's a form of suffering. All right? Projecting backwards. The good old days creates sorrow and depression. The good old days, they weren't as good as you remember, by the way, but we, that's how we do it. And then resistance to now. We always think it was better yesterday or it'll be better tomorrow, but now is, uh, you know, not good. Yeah. So the real work is understanding that. So how do you find now? And how do you rest in now? The easiest way to drop into the now is breath. 
The easiest way to manage your emotions is your breath. Your breath dictates, your breath is basically the window to your emotions. All emotions are revealed in the breath, and all emotions are controlled by the breath. Example, if you think it's funny, ha ha, ha ha, your breath. If you think it's kind of lame, you're all, you know. So if you think it's sour, it's, it's uh, sad, you'll, <laughs> you'll cry. Your breath gives it away. Watch the person's breath. If they really are excited and they want it, they're all going to be, right? Because the, the breath heats up. So now you know I got a live one. He's going to buy this old Mercedes from me because his breath kicked up. You can tell. Watch the breath, and that's the window to the emotions. To control the breath, you start to control the emotions. Control the emotions, you start to control the pain and the suffering. So we lengthen and regulate and strengthen the breath. So if you can, in, see, it was a lot of times it's as simple as erratic breath. So some of us, if you really watch, depending upon whether you're uh, excess yin or yang, you'll inhale longer than you exhale, or you'll exhale longer than you inhale, and very few of us do it evenly. So the first way of uh, balancing the emotions, so we have this silly little music to 4-4 four, four timing, and you inhale one, two, Four. Bang, exhale. One, two, three, four. Bang, inhale. And just the simple act of regulating your breath has a profound impact on your emotional state. One of the easiest ways to sever and cut off suffering is return to the breath. Regulate the breath. To regulate the breath, you turn off what they call the false thoughts and imputations. In other words, uh, there's a book called... Uh, a really good book. Uh, yeah, what was it called? Ten percent happier. Ten percent happier. This is a, a, a read it. It's a good book. He was a very famous uh, yeah. news anchor. anchor, news anchor, right? And he suffered like a nervous breakdown online. He sat there or on TV. He sat there for like twenty minutes. And everyone just looked at him because he had post. He was a, a war correspondent, and so it kind of freaked him out. And so he took up. And then he did a job researching meditation and spirituality and they to basically debunk it you know that was his job is to find the, 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 the nonsense but he found some teachings in it and he practiced those teachings and at the end of the day because everyone made fun of him so it was like well how's this meditation doing mr guru and his argument was well it made him 10 percent happy and you know and he is this is his quote because it turned it silenced the asshole in his head <laughs> That's what he's saying. Because you got this idiot in your head. And usually our internal dialogue, if you think about it, isn't positive. Sometimes, but most of the time it isn't. Most of the time you're not sitting there saying, my God, I'm great, I'm so sexy, this is amazing, I love this. <laughs> right? I, I wish you did, but we don't. And so by doing the internal breath work and basically turning the light around of consciousness, and turning off what they call fall, false thoughts and imputations. We, we, we seal and cut off suffering. And that's a big part of the training, yes. One part of pain that I, I find very interesting is the difference everyone has in pain threshold. Yes. I have friends who bump their elbow and sob. Yeah. And I come from a big family, and we kind of went off in the corner and licked our own wounds. Yes. So I have a, a great deal of and I think it has to do with nervous systems and culture. Nervous systems and culture. Some nervous systems, you know, well, women handle internal pain much better than a man. Thank God. So, so human race. Really. Yeah, because a man, you can punch him in the head, right, knock out his front tooth, and he will finish his cornflakes. <laughs> <laughs> but if he has a gas bubble, he's in fetal position. <laughs> it's, 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 it's really a weird thing. So it's just the nervous systems are, are different. You know what I mean? By design, I'm sure. So, so when we go through, we look at pain. We want to understand that there's a suffering thing. And what we teach is the concept of, you know, understanding that you have to move, you have to stand. So the moving we know is the lymphatic system. The standing, musculoskeletal, and you have to sit. Seated meditation to quiet the mind and remove the internal suffering. Those are the three ingredients of our pill. And try to overdose on it. Be great because you're not going to. So now we have, this weekend I have a, uh, an event, and you're all invited, you got the little piece of paper, it's a chief event, where I have more time. 
to explain a lot of this because 70 percent of what we do is really what they refer to as a mental training is a seated contemplation and observation of some of these basic principles and then when you go and move and you do all this stuff you know why and it works better so you're all invited you know to uh, participate this coming weekend and this kind of lecture is what we do you know and we go into greater detail and uh, greater definition of some of the energetic anatomy and physiology going on and what i try to do is simplify what i was taught and make it kind of more like a user-friendly terminology so that you can apply it today okay any last questions before we finish well uh, yes ma'am yeah, um, I don't know if there's time, but when we were talking about the breath, um, breath is related to emotions, and you control the breath, you control the emotions. What about the situation where someone's in grief, like someone is just passed and they're kind of holding their breath, and you say, okay, let's breathe, and then all of a sudden they burst into tears. Correct. Now they're breathing. You use a, a specific healing sounds for mourning, and you purge the stagnant chi in the lungs so that they can do what they call deliberate dry crying because it's all building and you go like this and because the lungs literally make a fist when you're grieving and you got to let it go and if you want to be stiff upper lip guy you'll just have a nervous breakdown so you can teach somebody how to deliberately cry to purge the grief in the specific organs in this case lungs that are responsible for monitoring grief so that's why we'll use healing sounds Great question. And we can, we'll, we talk more about all of that, you know, as you go through this training. Okay, everyone, well, I'm glad you all showed up. Great to see you.